I think my idea of success and other people's idea of success is different. You know, my idea of success is just just have an album in front of you that's 100% the vision in your head on CD, you know. Whereas I think a lot of people are uh, caught up in maybe wanting to win awards or wanting to write songs for people as opposed to what they like or, you know, caught up in wanting people to see them all the time on the street, whereas I don't even wear makeup when I'm not even working, you know. I, I have different, I think I have a different set of goals to, to the record company anyway, definitely. Amy Winehouse was one of the most discussed singer-songwriters of her generation. Her soulful voice won her critical acclaim, scores of awards and fans from all walks of life, while her turbulent and decadent lifestyle made her an irresistible target for the press. And the thing with people like Amy Winehouse is, when you become a celebrity, celebrity itself, you pay a price for it. Celebrity itself is a drug. In a time when photographs of Amy Winehouse in many states dominated the front pages, each new picture surpassing the last, as she appeared to incrementally crumble under the cocktail that was the magnitude of her success. It was her unique and heartfelt music that touched the hearts of millions of fans. That, that's really what I'm going for, you know, is people to just connect to it emotionally and feel like they're just getting me, you know what I mean? My music is the only area in my life where I'm fully confident and fully embrace everything, you know what I mean, so. Her debut album, Frank, thrust her into the limelight, but it was her second album, Back to Black, that made her an international superstar. After her death, Back to Black subsequently became the UK's best-selling album of the 21st century in 2012. It is an incredible album. Every song on that album is iconic. And that's how we'll remember her, as somebody who was completely an original. And I think Amy Winehouse was put on this earth to give us that album. Her rebellious and forthright personality, combined with her expressive songwriting ability, made her an icon, and she left behind a musical legacy that will be appreciated for generations to come. I come through when I'm singing more than when I'm talking and, you know, I could talk for three hours and not say the same thing as I could in three seconds on a track. We take an in-depth look at the rise and fall of one of Britain's most iconic musicians. Amy Winehouse's life was played out in the public eye. Her turbulent, heart-on-sleeve lifestyle made the music what it was. She wrote about her life, what happened to her, and this proved irresistible to the fans and media alike. A woman whose rawness, whose vulnerability was the same on and off record. It can be draining when you have written a song about something very, very serious to you. It can be draining, but also it gives you energy. You can get energy from writing a song about something personal because um, you are kind of shaking it off. And once you put it in a song, that's it, it's done for me. Or once I have put situations in a song, I'm cool about them and I can, I'm, I think, yeah, dusted, I'm cool now, you know, and it, it does go both ways, yeah. Somewhere along the way, in the massive success of Back to Black, Amy Winehouse the person became more famous than Amy Winehouse the singer. She gave the gossip columnists a ready-to-go soap opera, the kind of which hadn't been seen since Kurt Cobain exploded onto the mainstream psyche, with Nirvana's Nevermind. Eventually, as had happened to Kurt Cobain, she seemed trapped by the fame wanting only to return to the simplicity of making music. Her death happened suddenly, and even though the threat of it had been circling for what felt like years, it was still utterly shocking. Please recall by the London Ambulance Service to a house in Camden Square, North West 1, shortly before 16.05 hours today. One reports of a woman found deceased. 
On arrival, officers found the body of a 27-year-old female who was pronounced dead at the scene. Next of kin have been informed and I can confirm that the deceased is Amy Winehouse. Security checked on Amy in the morning on Saturday at 10 o'clock and she was still breathing fast asleep. And they checked again in the afternoon and she wasn't breathing. So there's about six hours between her last being checked and the time she died. Well, recently Amy hadn't been particularly well. You know, she'd, uh, I think in, at the newspaper we've reported in the last two or three weeks that she'd collapsed three times uh, because she'd drunk herself into a state where she, she was no longer conscious. But beyond that, I think the damage that had been done earlier on, 2005, 2006, that kind of time, when she got into Class A drugs, I think it was beginning to manifest itself and she did have some, some other health problems as a result. Heroin seems, seems to have completely taken over uh, most young people, crack. I mean, everywhere you turn, somebody's either going into rehab or coming out of it. And, you know, uh, our stars are dying off left and right. Amy Winehouse, how sad. How sad that she didn't have people who loved her enough to kick her in the butt and do an intervention and throw her, her butt in jail. Get her arrested, get her away from the stuff. There weren't people around her who loved her enough to force her not to kill herself. Sad. I think she was probably one of these, those type of singers come along once every 50 years, and they're a rarity. And I don't think you get singers like that very often. But when you have singers like that, you should protect them more and make sure that they're OK. I think everything that could be done for Amy was tried to be done, and she needed to help herself before anyone else could help her, really. So I think uh, she then no one else could have helped her any more than they tried to, so. Amy Winehouse's death definitely had a huge impact on the music world, the media world. It impacted my family. We live about a block and three quarters from her house, just coincidentally enough. The sociological impact of Amy's death was so much bigger than just the music world. It, was, it took my breath away. There were media from all over the world there. I mean, it was astounding. And this went on for about two or three days. The media trucks probably went in about 36 hours, but the crowds got bigger and bigger and bigger. At the height of it, I guess there were 2,000 people there, just milling about, mainly fans, that once the media had kind of gone away after the first 24, 36 hours. So my point is, Amy Winehouse's death, it, sure, it affected the world of music, but she really had the kind of musical style that touched a lot of hearts, because her house to this day, years later, is a shrine. And when I go home today, if I cut across the park and go by it, I promise you there'll be four dozen notes, a few bottles of vodka or whatever, and uh, some flowers for her. I promise you this, I promise you this. It still goes on today and it's years later. In honor of the late singer, a statue was erected in Camden, London, Amy's spiritual home. It was unveiled by Winehouse's friend, the British actress Barbara Windsor, in the presence of Amy's parents, Mitch and Janice, on September the 14th, 2014 which would have been the singer's 31st birthday. It's a day of um, incredibly mixed emotions, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and um, they, don't, they don't put statues up to people that are with us anymore. So it kind of reinforces the fact that physically she's gone, but spiritually, she'll never leave us. And um, I feel sad, very, very sad. But in Amy's inimitable way, she's kind of shaken the tree and some incredible things have happened, which I'll share with you in, in a few moments. But the most important thing is, is that my son and my daughter-in-law gave birth to a lovely baby boy three days ago. <laughs> what can be better than that? So, um, if I may, I'd like to say, a few thanks, because without the help of these people, we wouldn't be standing here today. And of course, our, our patron and dear friend, Barbara, um, what, she did failed, what she didn't tell you was when Amy was staying at the, uh, uh, at the London Clinic, the, the back entrance to the London Clinic is where Barbara lives, Barbara and Scott lives. And she would go out for a smoke, and uh, Scott said to Barbara, Scott said, that's Amy walking up and down. And uh, they went out and got her. She came in for a cup of tea. 
and um, it ended up that Barbara and Amy were doing, were, were rehearsing Barbara's East End the Lions, but Amy had to play Peggy. You following me? So Barbara had to play Pat. So you know it was all it was all messed up really. But uh, my thanks to Barbara for being a great source of inspiration to Amy and a and a haven of peace when it was all kicking off in some of the bad days that we had. Uh, you know, Amy went round to Scott and uh, and Barbara and really had a, a lovely chilled out time. And my many 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 thanks to them. Um, I had a laugh. That's right. Not so long before her death, Amy was a girl who grew up in love with music, a love of music handed to her by her family. Her upbringing was surrounded by jazz. Many of her uncles on her mother's side were professional jazz musicians, and her father sang as a child with his own family. I don't think our house was any different than anybody else's house. There was, I mean, when I was a, a small child, everybody was singing and dancing, literally dancing at home. They used to ballroom dance because there was no television. So what did people do to amuse themselves? They sang, they danced, they got up. You know, they'd stand me on the table in my grandmother's house and they'd say, ladies and gentlemen, Mitchell Winehouse, and I'd come out and I'd do a bow. And that's how people entertain themselves. I mean, it was different when Amy was growing up, obviously when she was a little kid, but we used to play the same games and the house was full of music and the extended family that I had when I was a little boy, it was the same in when Amy was a child. There was my mum, there was her, her, my, my, my stepfather, her, her husband, uh, Amy's grandfather. I mean, everyone was there. My grandparents were still alive when Amy was a little girl. You know, so it was, the house was always full of people. And they did the same thing. Ladies and gentlemen, Amy Winehouse, and she'd get up and do a little bow and then sing a little song. So um, that, that's how it started for her. My dad sings, and I sang as a child, obviously, and I just assumed growing up that everyone sings, you know. Um, that was really it. Winehouse's paternal grandmother was also once romantically involved with British jazz legend Ronnie Scott. As a result of this musical background, Amy ended up listening to a diverse range of music, from James Taylor to Sarah Vaughan. I was very influenced by jazz and hip-hop from early, you know, from maybe, I mean, seriously, I mean, that I would knew that it would be the thing, the direction I would follow in my life, maybe when I was, 13 is when I knew that I would have to follow that music because there was nothing else that spoke to me. And today, you know, I'm reminded every day how important music is to me. You know, people say, it's just music. Or Lisa from Steps, it's just a laugh, it's just music. And you're like, no, nothing else speaks to me the way music does. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing, you know. Um, they're, they're, with music there, and jazz in particular, there is a warmth and a, and a, a personable, no, it's, it's not a word. There's a warmth and a real um, natch, I can't explain it, but it just gets you very, uh, very direct. And um, you, you can really hear so much from that kind of music, not just the actual music, you can hear emotions in the music and texture. And, as a teenager, she became drawn to the rebellious spirit of TLC, Salt and Pepper, and other American R&B and hip hop acts. But definitely people like um, Thelonious Monk, Hendrix, and um, Sarah Vaughan, and uh, Louis Jordan, and Salt and Pepper, and um, Beastie Boys. There's just so many Beastie Boys and. Um, TLC when I was a little kid and uh, Carol King. After playing around with her brother's guitar, Amy bought her own when she was 14 and began writing music a year later. Soon after, she began working for a living, including at one time as an entertainment journalist. At 16, her close friend Tyler James, a soul singer, 
passed her demo tape to an A&R person. The move led to Winehouse signing with 19 Management, the management company owned by Simon Fuller, the man behind American Idol. With this expert backing, Winehouse signed to the record label Island Universal and eventually received a publishing deal with EMI. Winehouse hired a band, the Dap Kings, who had been the backing band for New York singer Sharon Jones, and set about writing and recording her first album. Winehouse's debut album, Frank, was released on October the 20th, 2003. Produced mainly by Salam Remy, many songs were influenced by jazz, and apart from two covers, Winehouse co-wrote every song. The album received positive reviews and entered the upper levels of the UK albums chart. It's a really versatile album and I, I pushed myself with every aspect of it. You know, the music stands up by itself so that you can have it on quietly and still just get the chords and kind of feel the chords. And the beats stand up so much that when you blast the music, you, it, it, sounds, it sounds ridiculous. And, you know, myself vocally, I try and do something interesting with everything in the, so with, in the songs. The debut single from the album, Stronger Than Me, was released on October the 6th, 2003. Amy Winehouse's music is very autobiographical. It doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to figure that one out. She really, I was gonna say write, wrote from the heart, and that's a cliche. She wrote, I think, from her soul, from her spirit, and also from her noggin. This is a very intelligent young lady. And I don't really feel or hear that there's a business plan in her lyrics. A lot of people, when I hear them sing, and I know I speak for a, a good few of us out there, they might as well be singing, please send money, please send money, please send money. And with Amy Winehouse, I feel like she's saying, this is my musical statement. I hope you like it, but if you don't, nonetheless, I'm Amy Winehouse and this is my musical statement. That, that first single, she's looking metaphorically uh, in the, the lyrics for a strong male figure in her life, in this case, a, r a romantic male figure. But in real life, she was looking for a strong male figure the whole time. Now, I'll have to leave it to psychologists to tell us what that means. In Amy Winehouse's life, there was not an overabundance of strong male positive figures. We know that now. Hindsight is 2020, And it's ironic that in the, one of these early videos, you have her searching for a strong male figure who isn't there. You have her having trouble with her romantic fella, her boyfriend. And that was much of the story of her life. You should be stronger than me. You've been here seven years longer than me. Don't you know you're supposed to be the man? Now pay. And it's crazy to think, here it is foretold in this very early video by this young lady. I'm not saying she's clairvoyant or anything, but it is tragic to look back at that video, knowing what we know about Amy Winehouse now, and think, oh my God, in three minutes, this is the story of this young lady's life. You should be stronger than me. But instead, you're longer than frozen turkey. It's just funny how all my singles are geared on this man, you know, I mean, I've written quite a few songs for this, this ex-boyfriend, but that's just because I was writing the album at the time, you know, and it just so happens that all the singles are like heartbreak. Like, they're, they're the three songs from when we split up, like serious, the serious songs. So um, I might never be able to get a boyfriend again. <laughs> In early 2003, Winehouse met Blake Fielder Civil, a music video production assistant at a local bar. The two began a stormy relationship and Winehouse had his name tattooed over her heart. What Amy saw in Blake was perhaps somebody who could actually understand her. And some men are incredibly good at, at latching onto women with problems to displace focus or having to focus on problems they themselves have. And they come across as the the, the knight in shining armor, the man on a white steed, and the woman falls for it, you know, and she'll think, oh my God, this man understands me, he loves me, you know, he really understands what, he's, what I'm going through, he's going through something similar to me, he can connect with me and I can connect with him in a way that I just can't with anyone else. 
I first met Amy in 2003 at the Brit Awards. It was the year before Frank was released. To be honest, nobody really knew who she was. I was wearing a dress with lots of tassels on. She came running up to me and said, mate, mate, love the dress, love the dress. I looked at her and I kind of recognised her. She was this chubby-faced, young, energetic, full of life having so much fun. You could see that she was visibly thinking, I'm at the Brits, this is amazing, as we all were. Frank was astonishing. You listened to it and you thought, hold on. It really hit you between the eyes, hold on, this voice is astonishing. Um, Amy wasn't happy with it. And that would really go on to flavor the rest of her career. She was a perfectionist and she didn't think her record company had done her justice. Everyone else thinks it was wonderful. But you look forward to Back to Black and you see perhaps it lacked the depth of feeling and experience. But as a debut album, it was incredible. I wouldn't write anything unless it was di directly personal to me, just because I, I wouldn't be able to tell the story right or really fill out the song with uh, with words because I wouldn't have done it. So, you know, all of it is um, stuff that I've been through and, you know, and even though some of it is um, t uh, personal in a sad way, you know, I would never let it just be that. It's very um, funny, like I, I'll put humour in, I'll always put a punchline in the song, always. And, um, I don't know, I just try and be different with my lyrics, definitely. I mean, this is a first album. This is quite a statement from somebody. This was a, uh, an award-winning album that was album of the year in all these pop magazines and jazz magazines. It sold incredibly well, and no one had heard of this young lady but just a few months before. And it was incredible to see just in a few short months she was a household name. Myself vocally, I try and do something interesting with everything in the, with, in the songs. So you could really listen to it, you know. Um, you, if you wanted a real emotional connection with my music, it's there. If you want to put it on in the background, cool. But it, my music is really intense. Um, if you're looking for that, you know, I mean, if you listen, you get back. I, you know, I give as good as I get. <laughs> and it's important, I think, to look back on Frank and remember, in those wonderful early days of her career, she looked healthy. She sounded... Uh, wonderfully uh, on target, on key, focused. I'm not just talking about her voice being on key, I'm talking about her whole approach had focus and measure and direction and it was really great. And I think what's sad about it is, is when she gets going on further in her career she starts to lose that. With Frank she's honest, she's pure, it's, it's as clean as we're gonna hear Amy Winehouse even though she's got the suggestive lyrics and can swear and so on and so forth, but it's Amy Winehouse Hello world, I'm here, and you never get that again. That, that's really what I'm going for, you know, is people to just connect to it emotionally and feel like, I don't know, like they're just getting me, you know what I mean? Probably more me with the, well, yeah, more me with the music than I am on any TV thing or any um, radio thing, because it's me, is my music is the only area in my life where I'm fully confident and fully embrace everything, you know what I mean? So. So, yeah. <laughs> In contrast to the jazz-influenced former album, Winehouse's focus shifted to the US girl groups of the 1950s and 60s. There's no question the, the Ronettes in particular, but many of the girl groups influenced Amy Winehouse's music. And look, just picking up the tabloids and looking at pictures of her, I was struck at how much she resembled Ronnie Spector. And a lot of the women back in those days had that haircut, uh, the beehive haircut, which is also known as the B-52, hence the name of the, the group. I think when you ad adapt that kind of a haircut that was at the time, and really now so wildly out of fashion, that you're making a statement and you're making a reference. There's no question cultural reference is being made. And when you listen to her music, you can hear it. But the, the strength of it isn't that she just did it, it's why she did it. It's because she's looking for something and she's not gonna stop looking until she finds it. And it takes the strength of a certain kind of an artist to go, I'll go with something that's not the most fashionable thing right now. 1960s girl groups from the Brill Building in New York City. And uh, I'll adapt that to my own personal style. It wasn't something that was currently in fashion. Yet the point of Amy Winehouse is, she's such a strong artist, she made it a fashion. And I think that's the whole point of her look and her sound with that kind of 
Chiffon's, Shirelle's, Ronette's thing. That's the whole point. She made it her own. She didn't just take from them and imitate them. She made it her own. In May 2006, Winehouse's demo tracks such as You Know I'm No Good and Rehab appeared on Mark Ronson's New York East Village radio show. Ronson would later go on to co-produce Amy's upcoming album. He really liked Amy. The moment they met, he thought, here's a girl who's not going to take any nonsense. She knows what she wants. And he loved her, he said, because when she didn't think he was being great, when, when his results weren't fantastic, she told him. And it worked for them. That honesty brought them together and created absolute dynamite, electricity. He polished her songs for Back to Black, perfected them. And even the harshest critics have said they drew on so many influences while still being completely original. And that's impossible to do. Uh, they did it. Amy was obviously an incredibly credible singer-songwriter off the back of her first release, Frank, which made waves in the UK, didn't so much around the world and in, in America, but it definitely set her up as a singer-songwriter to watch. But that creative combination between Mark Ronson and Amy Winehouse was something else. He really did elevate Back to Black. Obviously, it's Amy's work, and she made very clear that it was her work and that Mark just helped her with it, but I think his help really did push that album to a new level. Back to Black was released in the UK on October the 30th, 2006. It went straight to number one in the UK charts. In the US, it entered at number seven on the Billboard 200. It was the best-selling album in the UK in 2007, selling 1.85 million copies over the course of the year. The album spawned a number of hit singles. The first single released from the album was the Ronson-produced Rehab. Rehab is sadly and understandably one of Amy Winehouse's signature songs now. It's one of the songs she's most remembered for. I might be in a party of one, but I can hardly stand to hear it, and I can hardly stand to watch the video. The irony of this young lady singing about, I don't want to go to rehab, when at the end of the day, we now know that if there's anyone that ever should have gone to rehab, it's Amy Winehouse. It's easy to have perfect vision with hindsight. But there's a theory I've got that goes roughly like this. Everybody under 30 thinks they're badass. Everybody under 30 wants to be badass. We all leave that as we grow into adults and mature. Everybody under 30 thinks they're indestructible, invincible. Now, we've all had friends that have died in a horrible way, maybe cancer too soon, or maybe the tragedy of a drug overdose or alcoholism. It's, it's in so many families, too many families. And yet, it can't happen to me. And when I look at rehab, I, th I see a young lady singing a catchy pop tune about the perfectly, most incredibly wrong subject she could ever sing about, coming from where she stands. And I just can't look at rehab and, and, and Amy Winehouse in that video. I can't, I can't listen to it anymore. As much as I like her as an artist and enjoy her music, I, I can't stand it anymore. It's, it's the irony and the tragedy. It's just, they're just piled on top of each other. And it, it makes me want to weep, so I shut it off. They try to make me go to rehab. I say no, no, no. Yes, I've been black, but when I come back, you no, no, no. I ain't got the time. And if my daddy thinks I'm fine, he's trying to make me go. The title track, Back to Black, was released in the UK in April 2007 and peaked at number 25, but was more successful across mainland Europe. When you look at something like Back to Black and you see a video and it's a stark, dark black and white video and it ends up they're going to a graveyard, you just think, young lady, you have talent. You still have your looks. The world is your oyster. Money is coming your way. People love you. They love you in a deeply fundamental way. And yet, you never get the feeling, and Back to Black is a video and a song, 
and the album to a certain extent, reinforce this. You never get the feeling, hey, I'm Amy Winehouse and I'm enjoying this. This is good. I've worked for this and I've wanted it and now that it's here, I'm enjoying it. You don't get that feeling and it makes it so sad for a fan to look at something like that and think, we're in a graveyard, we're shooting this video, everything's grim. Are we not gonna have a fun, saucy, frothy, happy, go lucky pop video? And the answer is probably not. No, we're not gonna. There's just something about it. There's something about that video that, 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 that makes me feel sad for. It's like, okay, it's a great artistic statement, but don't you just once want to lighten up and enjoy life? Two more singles were released from the album. Tears dry on their own and love is a losing game, but they failed to achieve the same level of success as previous singles. On the deluxe version, I think it is, of, of Back to Black, she, she does a, an additional version of Love is a Losing Game. And, and again, she sings that with so much heart and, and so much soul. And then when the song's finished, she turns around at the end, there's a pause, and you to hear her say, is that all right? And <laughs> you can see in that both her brilliance and her insecurity. She's just done something totally incredible, totally magical. She's done a rendition of this song that could move a, a stone statue to tears. She's, she's really delivered this. And then she says, all right, because she needed the approval of others. She, she was incredibly, and when she was performing on stage, she was sometimes looking for reassurance from the band. Sometimes people who are brilliant sometimes don't realise quite how brilliant they are, and, and Amy, was, Amy was one of those, and, and, and perhaps it was her brilliance in some ways, and coping with that brilliance and the effect of that brilliance that drove her to addiction. Love is a losing game by story fire. You came love as a losing game. What I, I wish I never played. Oh, oh, what a mess we made. And now the final frame. Love is a losing game. As her fame grew, so did speculation in the press about her lifestyle. Her weight was a particular focus, with the once curvy singer appearing to drop several dress sizes in 2006. Winehouse told an interviewer her new slim look was due to cutting back on her use of marijuana. In her 20s, she, she lost somebody very close to her in her grandmother. She entered into a destructive relationship with Blake, but her addiction was already had already taken a firm hold of her at that point. So when we look at where addiction starts for Amy Winehouse, it's very difficult to know. But one thing we can be certain, from a psychological perspective, Amy Winehouse's addiction would have started from a position of pain. Because unless you feel pain, you do not become an addict. Excessive substance abuse, whether you've got a big body or a small petite body like Amy Winehouse, will ravage your body in all sorts of different ways. And some of these things are, are, are very general across the use of the drug, but some are like the, the impairment of cognitive capacity, the impairment of judgment, the, 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 the um, all sorts of physiological effects. Where, where, like in Amy Winehouse's case, where a drug addiction brought on emphysema, it wrecks your body, drugs wreck your body. But, but the point is, every addict knows that. You know, it's no secret. And the physiological effects of, 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 of alcohol and, 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 and illegal substances are, are, are of course, as, as, as manifold as the people who consume them, but ultimately they wreck the body. Winehouse's tempestuous relationship with Blake was the catalyst for much of her destructive behavior. During one breakup, Winehouse admitted to drowning her sorrows in alcohol but she used the heartbreak as impetus in writing her music. 
Her drug and alcohol intake increasingly affected her live performances as she turned up to several club or TV performances too drunk to complete her set. Her management company suggested she entered rehab, but rather than take their advice, she dumped the management company and turned the experience into the catchiest song of her career. In early 2007, Amy and Blake ended relationships with other partners and got back together. In May, the couple were married in Miami, Florida, with Winehouse telling Rolling Stone magazine, I know I'm talented, but I wasn't put here to sing. I was put here to be a wife and mum and look after my family. In June of that year, Winehouse, who had admitted to problems with depression and self-harm, was seen in a video posing for a photographer while scratching I Love Blake on her stomach with a shard of broken glass. She was known to carve I Love Blake in glass on her stomach. Now, now, whether the relationship was, was good, bad or indifferent is, is, is not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm making is from Amy's point of view, she saw in Blake somebody she could connect with, a soulmate, a male version of her. He sold himself to her as the one who could understand her and the one who could rescue her. But the reality was they were both on the road to ruin. And, and by forming a little cocoon, if you want, a sense of us against the world, that we're in this little bubble, we're in it together, and come hell or high water, we have a connection that nobody else will understand. And that's very seductive. Just two months later, she was rushed to hospital in London, suffering from exhaustion, though she later admitted it was a drug overdose. Shortly after, Winehouse and Fielder Civil checked into a rehabilitation retreat, but checked out a few days later and went on holiday to St Lucia. Amy's time in St Lucia was absolutely bizarre because we all thought she'd go there for a couple of week break and Amy being Amy, she went and she fell in love with it and she decided I must move here because she was quite irrational like that in a way and she did actually spend weeks and weeks on end in St Lucia and I think the record company thought this would be a good opportunity for her to her to finally work on that third album. So they did set her up in a record studio on the island but in the end but from what I was told the material they were getting was just not up to scratch and most of it was scrapped. The controversy continued in October 2007, with the couple being arrested in Norway for possession of marijuana. In November, police raided Winehouse's London home and arrested Fielder Civil on charges of trying to pervert the course of justice. Police alleged Fielder Civil had tried to pay off a witness due to give testimony in an assault case he was involved in. In the end, Amy would do anything for Blake. She was desperate to keep him out of prison and there are rumours that she even tried to pay people off to keep Blake out of the police cells, but it just didn't work. She couldn't do it. He was a bad apple and he was always going to go down. Later that month, with Blake in jail, Winehouse turned up to a Birmingham concert, drunk and emotionally distressed. She was booed by the audience and the critic for the Birmingham Mail said the show consisted of a supremely talented artist reduced to tears, stumbling around the stage and unforgivably swearing at the audience. She later cancelled all further appearances for 2007, saying on her website, I can't give my all on stage without my Blake. My husband is everything to me, and without him, it just isn't the same. On the 22nd of January 2008, the Sun newspaper revealed footage of Winehouse allegedly smoking a crack pipe and talking about taking ecstasy and Valium. She entered a rehab facility days later with her record company issuing a statement saying she has come to understand that she requires specialist treatment to continue her ongoing recovery from drug addiction. Two weeks later, Winehouse won five categories at the 2008 Grammy Awards, but visa complications arising from her drug use prevented her from attending in person. 
Does the State Department believe that Amy Winehouse, her music or her behavior poses a threat to the United States? And if not, why did you reject her visa application? Um, the State Department believes that uh, she is ineligible for a visa under the terms of the Immigration and Nationality Act. I don't believe anyone ever used the word threat associated with it, but there are many reasons for which um, individuals are not el eligible or otherwise need to have a waiver process. Um, the main point in this, Matt, is uh, she's not eligible under the, the basic terms of the law unless a waiver is processed for her. She's asked for one. I understand uh, Department of Homeland Security is considering it, and uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. She accepted via satellite from London and performed her hits, You Know I'm No Good, and Rehab. The American officials said, no, no, you're involved with drugs, you're not getting in. How ludicrous is that? I think the American music producers were pretty embarrassed by that. Amy got round it and thankfully did a great performance um, from the UK on a live link. And the more you look back, and it's easy to say this in retrospect, the more you look back at Amy Winehouse's life, you just think, she was a living legend. Who else would do that? Who else would be banned from America and still be cool and show them that she was here in the UK? And yeah, her reputation uh, grew from there too. Award success aside, 2008 was a memorable year for all the wrong reasons for Winehouse. Further breakdowns and attempts at intervention by her family all but bought promises of an exceptional career to a shuddering halt. Her turbulent marriage to Fielder Civil continued to deteriorate to the point that he requested a divorce based on both claims of adultery and also to save the life of his wife. They divorced in August 2009. The family division of the High Court in Court 3 today, uh, Blake Fielder Civil and Amy Winehouse were divorced uh, Amy was accused uh, in the petition of committing adultery, which she um, uh, admitted in her response to the proceedings, and the district judge made the uh, uh, decree nisi today, pronounced it. Do you agree with the statement of the petitioner as to the grounds of the jurisdiction set out in the petition? And she admits the adultery. Yes. I, th I think that uh, the fact that she hasn't protested in any way about it, um, that she's agreed to pay costs, does suggest that she just wants it over and done with as quick as possible. She's, it's, she's yes, no, wherever she needs to say it, just to get it over with. Um, I think that, yeah, it now becomes an issue of who is going to get the money. Uh, I think that the position that she's in is that when she admits adultery through a marriage, however tempestuous that marriage happened to be, She's probably going to end up having to shell out something. Uh, whether it be half her fortune, I don't know. But I think maybe a million, maybe two million is more uh, a likely figure that we may see um, being handed over. It's, it's been a very tumultuous relationship. There's been a lot of ups and downs. And, of course, I'm sure she is heartbroken. Um, I mean, effectively, they've not been together for quite a while now. This isn't something they've broken up last week. He's been in jail, she's been in St Lucia. They've not really seen each other, not had much contact. So I doubt that um, she's going to be amazingly heartbroken today. Maybe the fact that this is now official, it's not just a theory, is going to have an effect on her. I'm sure she's upset. She's got a lot going on in her life at the moment. Um, you know, only she knows how she feels about this uh, and only they know, you know, how this is all broken down. Perhaps her family and friends were hoping the split from Blake would encourage her to give up drugs. But sadly, this was not to be. Although Winehouse put in a number of performances in the ensuing years, she was booed off stage or unable to complete her set on several occasions. In July 2010, she sang the hit track Valerie alongside Mark Ronson at a film premiere, but forgot some of the words. 
the singer hit the headlines in June 2011 when she opened what was supposed to be a 12-date European tour in Belgrade. Winehouse appeared to be a shadow of her former self and was booed off stage. If you want to ruin your evening, watch some of that footage. This, this sweet girl who no amount of swearing on stage is going to tell me is a bad person. Oh, I can hear and watch her do it. I've seen the footage. But no amount of watching that footage is going to convince me that this person is fundamentally bad or evil. Nope. This person is fundamentally hurt and messed up and angry in some way. I don't know exactly what, but nothing's going to tell me she's a bad person. Yet here she is behaving horribly in front of the people that love her the most. This show was a complete and utter shambles. It was the worst yet. And believe me, there'd been some pretty bad Amy Winehouse performances over the last few years. However, she was booed off stage. She threw the microphone into the crowd. She didn't remember her words. And of course, in this modern day of YouTube, it all ended up on the internet within a few hours. And at that point, there was huge pressure on her management because so many questions have been asked. Why was she on tour in the first place? Fact of the matter is, when I saw her on stage during that shambolic performance in Belgrade, I just thought, this is not right. This is not a woman who should be on stage. She should not be performing. Something has to be done here. It was actually terrifying and tragic to watch. Now, what her manager did was give her small gigs where she was the support act. He didn't want to put her in a stadium with tens of thousands of people because that would be too much for her. But even the small gig she was playing, she couldn't handle. There was a feeling with her management that, come on, she's ready. There were glimmers of hope there that she was back on her feet, but she couldn't handle the pressure. And when she was booed that night in Belgrade, well, it's a vicious circle. She probably took drink and drugs to bolster her confidence, and then when she was on stage, people booing, it shattered her confidence so much. When you've been put up there, when you've had five Grammys in one year and a Brit Award for Best Female, and then you go from that to being booed, to being panned, how would you take that? And somebody like Amy wasn't strong enough to take it. The shambolic performance sparked a storm of media criticism and it was announced shortly afterwards that she would not be completing the tour. This was to be the last gig of her short career. But alas, there, there is no rule book for when she went through. How many times do we have to see an Amy Winehouse or a Kurt Cobain or a Jimi Hendrix or whoever go through this? And the answer is, we're going to see it a lot more. That's just, that's, that's just the way it is. There's no one that can speak to these people. There's no one. I think the real tragedy is that there were glimmers of hope, that sometimes she did look okay, she was trying to write songs, she was able to perform now and then. And that's the real tragedy, that, that we thought she might just get there. I wasn't surprised by the huge volume of fans who wanted to pay tribute to Amy. It was a bit like Princess Diana, but it was a very different sort of fan who was coming up. It was young people, it was people who'd been affected by her life. 
Some people, I think, really related to Amy's battles, but I wasn't surprised because she was an icon in Britain. And especially for 20-somethings in Britain, she represented a new breed of pop star. And I think while everyone had been horrified by what had happened to her in the end, everyone thought that she was going to go on and, and sing for the next 50 years. And I think that's one of the reasons why people were just so upset. This year, was I was on tour when Amy Winehouse uh, passed. And my band and I, we wrote a song dedicated to Amy shortly before she died. It's really a sobering um, experience because there are so many amazing voices and I think every voice is important in delivering messages and Amy's is one of the strongest. Um, I was hoping that had she lived longer, she could use her voice and lend it to some of the causes around the world that you know other artists have done. People like Michael Jackson lending his voice to philanthropic causes or, or Bono or uh, Willie Nelson. And um, it's just sad. It's really sad. Winehouse's last recording was a duet with American singer Tony Bennett, Duets 2. Their single from the album Body and Soul was released on September the 14th, 2011 on MTV and VH1 to commemorate what would have been her 28th birthday. The reason she recorded Body and Soul was because it was my favourite song. She went to Tony Bennett, he gave her six songs to, to choose from on the album and, and I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm doing Body and Soul. And, I'm so, and I said, well, why are you doing that? She said, because it's it's your favourite song, Dad. Shut up! And I said to her, I said to her, do you know the words? And she said, Dad, you've been singing it to me for 25 years. So that's my favourite song. Her father, Mitch Winehouse, launched the Amy Winehouse Foundation with the goal of raising awareness and support for organisations that help vulnerable young adults with problems such as addiction. As her dad, it must be difficult, but do you have an overriding favourite memory of Amy? Well, you know, it, there are so many, it's difficult to know where to begin. A humor. A humor, I mean, we would... Uh, I, I was just talking before about... Uh, I think two months after Back to Black came out, she was number one all over the world. She was Adele and Lady Gaga rolled into one, and she said to me, Dad, let's go for a walk in Soho. And we started at the top of Wardour Street, and we're walking down, and she said, just a sec, Dad. She went into the Caribbean restaurant, went downstairs, and she was talking to her friend down there, and the cook, her name's Auntie, and she knew all about her and all about her family. And then we came out, and then we went into... Ryman's the stationer, she knew all the girls in there. Then we went, you know, everywhere she stopped, she knew everybody and was gen genuinely knew everything about them. I remember looking at her and thinking, you know what, there are not a lot of young women in your position that will bother with this kind of stuff. Like and, yeah, my mum was exactly the same. And that was, I was, that made me so proud of her. She was just a normal, normal girl with obviously an extraordinary talent lovely girl. Well, I think this and more, there's a lot of things of how caring she was. That's what it's about. It wasn't about her. She was always everyone else. And that is what it is. So, her caring. It's very important. I think, like, you know, obviously she was evidence of how important it actually was. And, um, you know, she was a public figure and it's kind of so tragic that what happened to her, but, you know, the, the con these kind of outcomes happen, like, all the time with young people who aren't in the public eye. And I just think, like, it's really important that, like, you know, with the kind of pull of the attention of the media that she had as a person that that it turns into something positive and I think that her family and she would have wanted that to happen so I'm happy to be here to support her. You know we had it in a very short time, we had some amazing times together, we got to make some great music and then forever grateful because she kind of was the reason that I have a career really, you know. I only met her once and um, she was like, she was like really sort of ballsy like me, but I was like kind of shocked there was somebody else like that. <laughs> she was like, hello, I was like, all right. It was just like, Ooh. And then um, 
I don't know, I just remember being struck by like how charismatic she was and um, definitely not somebody you could forget. I was with Island Records for eight years when I first started. And it, my uh, uh, Darkus, who is the head of Ireland, he called me out when he first signed her and said, could you please play this, listen to this demo I'm gonna send you and play it on your show. And it was Frank. And I heard it and I immediately called him back and said, send that girl down here right now. She came in and that's when we first met and I interviewed her for my show. And then I put her on at the Jazz Cafe, her first show at the Jazz Cafe. And that was right at the beginning. She's lovely, lovely girl. And, then, and one day, uh, I looked out my window, my little news, and there I saw I, a lady who I thought was Amy Winehouse sitting on a wall. It was one Sunday, and I said, Scott, isn't that Amy Winehouse? And what happened, my, I, I back onto a hospital, and she used to go there every now and then. So he went out, and he chit-chatted away to her. And uh, anyway, he invited her in, and that became a regular thing whenever she had to go you know, just to get herself together or whatever. She'd always call in and uh, we became very close because of that. So it's, me it's a great memory that I got to know her and, and, and you know, we used to do silly things like she'd read East Ender scripts with me and, and all that kind of thing, yeah. She always insisted on playing Peggy Mitchell, that was the great thing, yeah. And, all, and that was it, you see, so I'm really thrilled that I got to meet her. But I was a huge fan of hers. I'm a, I'm a big, big uh, jazz lady, and I think she had a lot of that, that feeling about her, you know. And, um, but wonderful, wonderful. One of our best, one of our all-time best. You know, every, every maybe 10, 15 years, you get a great one that comes along, and that was her. They don't come along very often. She was very unique, and she started a whole new style. Adele and all these girls couldn't be here if it wasn't for Amy. She started something. She made it about the voice again, and that was amazing, you know? Not about looking pretty and all that stuff. It was about pure talent, you know? The terms legend and genius when it comes to singer-songwriters are way too overused. Amy deserves them, she absolutely does. There's only one album that was amazing, but my God, what an album it was. It will be played forever. Um, and Amy Winehouse, it's not just the songs. There was only one Amy Winehouse. There was only one girl with the daft hair and that she had her look, she had her sound, and she was loved. I think she will fundamentally in the end be remembered for her voice, which was so unique. But I also think she should be remembered as a songwriter. Incredible lyrics, incredible melodies. And also she was groundbreaking because remember at the time when Amy burst onto the scene, it was all about Britney Spears and those sorts of artists. And she paved the way for the likes of Adele. And I don't believe we would have Adele, who's now the biggest recording star in the world, if we hadn't had Amy Winehouse before her. Much can be said about the late Amy Winehouse, one of the UK's flagship vocalists during the 2000s. The British press and tabloids seem to focus on her rowdy behaviour, heavy consumption of alcohol and tragic end. But fans and critics alike embraced her rugged charm, brash sense of humour and distinctively soulful and jazzy vocals. They're the legendary parts that composed Amy Winehouse an unparalleled force who was taken too soon, but whose work will radiate into eternity. The one thing that has to be said, though, that somewhere with a woman like Amy Winehouse, who had such enormous talent, such huge talent, and lived so much on the edge and fought so valiantly against her addiction, people kind of identify with that kind of struggle. People think, you know what, there but for the grace of God go I and somewhere they just want to give her a tribute. Well, you might not have made it, but you did your best, and that's what matters. And Amy Winehouse once said, I don't ever want to be mediocre. She says, and she talked about people in the chart, she says, they have no soul. Well, the thing about Amy Winehouse was, there was nothing mediocre about her, and she had bucket loads of soul. That's why she should be remembered, and that's why people really want to pay tribute to her.